Well, great. Uh, uh, amazing to have you here today. Uh, we have heard lots about your um, enthusiastic actions to uh, measure pollution in uh, Serbia with a group and of enthusiasts of uh, uh, members uh, uh, of your organization. And uh, we are, we, we, we would like to hear about uh, your views on the topic and the lecture that we we that you planned for today. Uh, thank you very much. And Greka, I'm giving you the floor now. Thank you, Ljubiša, and thanks um, for the introduction. And um, um, good afternoon or good morning uh, for people joining in. Uh, I appreciate taking the time uh, to join us today. And um, so, as you said, firstly, by the end of today's lecture, uh, you'd be exposed to some ideas about relationship between living organisms and their physical environment, including humans, in other words, ecology. And then um, we will uh, later on focus on the corrosive effects humans have had on our planet Earth. Uh, in the last uh, 150 years or since the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in 1850s, we've managed to raise the temperature, uh, a global average of um, uh, one uh, degree Celsius. And um, secondly, then uh, we will look into some of the innovative ideas in what kind of approaches and solutions uh, hypotheses there are to tackle the climate change and what has been undertaken so far politically. And it's what would be helpful to address the climate change and global warming. And lastly, we're gonna look whether and if internet technologies uh, could help alleviate and soften the problem uh, that we have. So um, with that, I think um, if you uh, move to the next slide, if we go back just um, two years back, this data point tells us a lot. The word of the year in 2019 was climate urgency. So there's no doubt um, that the climate change is one of the most pressing existential threats um, that we face as a humanity, in addition to let's say nuclear war and maybe AI, as uh, Professor Yuval Harari would say. And um, the next slide. The Oxford word of the year of the 2020 only last year was unprecedented, nothing like this before. And it meant it has left many of us speechless because of COVID-19 and what we've been experiencing. And if you think that year 2020 has given us hard times, um, think again. If you think that COVID has brought us unprecedented times, um, think again. Um, with everyone worrying, um, first of all, for their own life and then the life of others and neighbors and colleagues and then the economy and the planet, climate change is going to be much harder and vaccine was a let's say not an easy innovation because it was developed over the last 20 years but we need a much more innovation and a much more political will and everyone's effort um, to face the challenges uh, that is in front of us and the way how i see this challenge in front of us is actually what we need to do. Uh, we need to rebuild and re-engineer the entire society with the long-term sustainability in mind. Next slide. And that's a tall order. You can see that uh, maybe in 2020, when the airplanes have been grounded, the silence of everything started to make us think maybe nature is fighting and the comeback will have uh, a good effect of, of COVID-19, although it's been um, a, a difficult period and still is for everyone. Um, it only represents the emissions that have been cut from this aviation transport. Uh, it represents a very minor percentage of the emissions we need to cut. 
So it is here and maybe the making the carbon zero emissions that we need to get to, to by 2030 slips away each day and that we do not act. And uh, next slide. You can see that um, the fight for the better ecology and the relationship of, of uh, human made impact um, on, on the planet has begun some in the 70s. And, um, but we're witnessing that the icebergs are melting and that uh, permafrost is thawing and 20 out of 50 past years have been the hottest ever recorded years. So let's try to think today um, how to act better, how to better design our future and how to uh, and design our energy sources. Um, and in other words, how do we look after our world? Uh, the next slide, please. You might be familiar with this picture, it um, dates back in 2016, and it was caused by the uh, thawing of permafrost in Siberia. Um, with the um, thaws, um, thawing of permafrost, some old bacteria got released, and um, at that time, some quarter of a million reindeer were about to be slaughtered in Siberia because they have caught the anthrax bacteria. Next slide. With this exponential um, race and for carbon emissions and um, excavating our resources, um, scientists said that by the year of 2100, our summers may last as long as six months. And you can imagine what will that mean uh, for the agriculture and whether it would generate enough crops and whether it would feed all the mouths that needs to be fed in an increasing uh, population. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the darkest pictures uh, that this writer of the inhabitable earth, um, a very realistic picture that he paints, um, is, is worth reading. Um, he actually says that these destructive elements of the climate change act as chain reactions and they trigger further warming and therefore we experience the rising of sea levels and floods and causing mass hunger and new diseases, as well as with temperature rising, apparently the human conflicts would be on the rise too. Next slide, please. And here is the question um, that we are really uh, trying to address today. Can inter internet technology help with environmental and climate change? As you can see, the emissions are very complex and the effects it has on the globe um, um, are affecting all, all of vegetation and pollution and sea levels and we're losing um, genetic diversity and the temperatures are rising and we're increasing the solar radiation because the ozone hole is, um, is there. Um, so next slide please. Uh, what has happened in 2015 is that some 196 countries with the political will and that was um, led by the United Nations Paris Climate Agreement have agreed to cut their emissions uh, by 2030 and that is a very important goal. As you can see some 146 countries have ratified it and 48 have signed um, and, and then there's still some that needs uh, to sign them. Next slide please. Uh, so the um, one of the sustainable development goals, which were also set um, in the United Nations in 2015, was the climate action, the goal number 13, the SDG 13. And uh, next slide, please. And in that slide, we can see some of the output targets uh, that uh, what we need to do in order um, to get um, by 2030, we need to strengthen the resilience of the uh, and adaptive capacity um, for all these climate related disasters that we are witnessing. We also need to integrate climate 
change measures into policies and planning, and we need to build knowledge and capacity. And there are also two ways how we're going to achieve these targets, and that is by following to implement the UN framework on Convention on Climate Change and to promote the mechanisms to raise the capacity for planning and management. Next slide, please. Uh, tomorrow, uh, this is the week of the, um, today is, by the way, the, the, uh, the world's um, day. And to, tomorrow, the, um, the 40 world leaders will meet um, with Joe Biden in the US. But the point here is that some um, um, 40 leaders that are actually responsible for some 85% of global um, carbon dioxide emissions. And um, you can also see in the slide here, in this little um, slide, how the opinion uh, amongst the two um, parties in the US has changed uh, over the years from 2010 until 2020, that people who are aware um, and, and want the ad to address the climate change, that they see that there's a priority is rising in the blue. Um, I don't know if you see my um, arrow, but it is above around the 80%. Um, and, and yet the Republicans, there's only 20%. So um, that's an important uh, thing to say. But one of the things that will be discussed over the next couple of days is really who is responsible for this um, 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 emission. And uh, next slide, please. How the uh, we need to see whether the countries, developing countries, which are currently low emitters, are going to pay um, for the emissions that are being carried out um, by the um, high emitters. As we have seen, the new president in the US has decided to form something called the Civilian Climate Corps, and, um, and um, he's been criticized by the Wired magazine that that is not enough. And um, uh, well, that uh, financial support uh, should go to, um, it's actually is going towards the lack of the problem and to address uh, some of these um, uh, weather disasters that, and, and, uh, that they have been experiencing. And um, I think it's important to see uh, this move uh, to actually recognize uh, that there should be action by civilians to help FEMA and others uh, alleviate the, um, the cause of the many, um, um, many hurricanes and, um, and, and other um, weather disasters and climate change disasters that are facing, are going to be faced uh, by 2030. So some people are thinking ahead. Next slide, please. Um, this is the hard goal that's been set by the um, Paris Agreement to be carbon neutral by 2030. And also, next slide, please, to be carbon zero by um, 2030. And now what is a difference? The Actually, the carbon neutrality refers to achieving net zero carbon dioxide emissions. And that could be done uh, by balancing the emissions of carbon dioxide and then with its removal from the atmosphere by eliminating emissions from society. And um, uh, with carbon zero, um, what that means is that we refer to carbon zero when there's no production of carbon emissions from a product or a service. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, to also remind ourselves um, that in addition to technology innovation, and, um, and uh, the forestation plays an important role um, as the um, UN Farmland Agriculture Organization said that um, foresting will play a really decisive role in ending hunger and improving the livelihoods and combating the climate change. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was a really an inspiration, I think, for myself um, and many other people when um, inspiration in a way that we got upset when a river in New Zealand got a, um, a legal right of a human because they needed to give a legal entity to a river in order to complete the court case where they've been fighting for many years. 
um, Maoris, the indigenous people of New Zealand, uh, wanted to, to keep the river clean. And therefore, imagine if we would have to have all um, entities in the world, rivers and mountains, um, given a, a legal entity in order to fight them in court cases. So that was a bit of a wake up call. Um, the, this case was successful. Uh, next slide, Pete, please. Um, one thing that people get really, um, I, I think, um, um, uh, really um, interested in is how is the carbon footprint calculated because of the um, overall global emissions um, you need to um, uh, usually the national grids will have the numbers of renewables of wind of solar of energy and of um, fuel and fossil fuels and uh, you would then look at the uh, global energy spent and then divide that per capita per year and you would get uh, these um, numbers on this slide. Um, I would recommend um, checking the website worldofmeters.info which is also we've been familiar maybe with COVID-19 looking at the number of victims every day. Uh, next slide please. Um, and this um, picture has been taken or the graph the infograph has been taken as well um, from there and it's try trying to show you um, where do uh, where is the global fossil uh, emission coming from and you can see that the biggest charge um, in here is 38.50 it's the power industry and then the 21 uh, percent uh, which is almost um, uh, the next one down uh, it's uh, um, sorry, it's it uh, says the gray area there is the other industrial combustion, and this is the steel and cement industry, which is usually not something we first think of when we think of global emissions. How could um, cement and and um, and uh, industry actually produce uh, so much of um, CO2 in the atmosphere? Um, you can see that transport is only 20% and, um, and so on. Um, next slide, please. Um, as I said, the fight uh, to help the environment and ecology and the biodiversity started back in the 70s. And first we had these CFCs, uh, which were um, uh, very lethal to the ozone layer, and they are contained in refrigerators and many of the uh, house appliances that we have. And the real, um, um, I think, success was that we stopped using so much SFCs and we went into a HFCCs. And this is a big improvement in the green gases because they contain hydrogens and they break down more easily at, in the atmosphere than CFCs and therefore it protects more of an ozone layer. But there is also a long way um, to think that many households coming online or coming also uh, and getting their first um, refrigerator would still use HSFCs and will still emit uh, some of the um, CO2 in the atmosphere, producing the overall global warming. Next slide, please. Um, there are also something, they, these are traditional technologies or some of the ideas how we think we're going to face the climate change, um, the output of the CO2 emissions, the so-called BECS and CCS technologies. And what BECS stands for is this bioenergy and carbon capture storage, where we'd be producing biomass from uh, plants or from dead animals and um, and burning this biomass may also give some CO2 emissions as well. And that's a real question, what is the right balance? Um, but the carbon capture and storage is something that um, is definitely going to be with us, I think, and stay in all. And uh, we've seen technologies and industries developing how to do um, carbon capture and storage extraction of the um, uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so one of the um, 
um, this idea is actually when you see how you vacuum the gas from the atmosphere, it's the story of sex, uh, sequestration. Um, so sucking out the CO2 from the atmosphere and then packing it into um, some form and then putting it on the ground as it is today done with uh, nuclear waste, for example. Next slide, please. Some other ideas you can see here that how we're going to reinvent uh, over the next 10 years our economies and markets. We need to have these offset credits that the big consumers will be buying to make themselves um, in line with the supply chain or it to make themselves carbon neutral. So it's a very important uh, part. And um, however, from the acebreak1.com, which is a UK startup, we have learned that it's very hard to come with uh, incentives for uh, net zero incentives for the industry and, um, and to create financial instruments that uh, those who use, um, produce too much, um, um, use too much uh, global energy will then be buying to offset their carbon, carbon footprint. Uh, next slide, please. And um, certainly if we look a little bit um, in the future and um, in, in some of the innovations, um, we can see that artificial meat um, is going to be certainly one that uh, will uh, show up uh, over the next um, few years. And uh, we know that there's a lot of investors uh, looking into that because, and a lot of people becoming vegetarian at the same time in order um, uh, to uh, save the, um, you know, the farmlands and to produce the food that we will need to produce. Next slide, please. Um, there are also other um, uh, ways of creating energy in addition to nuclear energy. There's thorium, and I think um, uh, scientists in, in the room today in the session know a little bit more, but there's um, um, good, there's a lot of information on the net that you can look and uh, whatever energy we continue to use, um, I think um, that one uh, sounds a lot uh, promising. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now we go into the realm of the internet, this uh, network of networks where people voluntarily join to be part of the network and which only covers half of the planet um, currently today. Um, we uh, know that the scientists um, are telling us that um, we need negative uh, emissions technology to reach the pledge of the Paris Agreement so that the world um, is uh, the global average warming is kept um, below to to centigrade Celsius, ideally 1.5 uh, centigrade Celsius. Um, and um, I will now go into the section where we talk about the usage of uh, internet and, and its usage of energy. So one of the professors in the University of Manchester, Jankovic, uh, has been studying this for quite some time, saying that uh, some 40 to 60 billion messages of spam today create a lot of uh, emissions. And you can think about everything else, the, um, the computer processor units and um, the emails and browsing and streaming and so on. So that's on the rise. Uh, next slide, please. The internet energy consumption, according to the next generation internet sustainable um, webinar, it actually claims that the internet already uses 9% of the global energy. And the most extreme estimates are saying that uh, the use could go as high as 23% of global, um, that could produce as high as 23% of uh, global greenhouse emissions by 2030 which means that it's getting very close to that number of aviation today. And therefore there is this uh, need, um, um, and there's a need to transition towards a very safer, more resilient and better and sustainable internet. Um, I, if you see the picture here, it actually shows a solar powered website. Um, and uh, you can find out more information on the low, at the low tech magazine. Um, uh, what the scientists are doing, um, trying to use renewable energy for um, feeding the use of computers, um, phones and uh, servers. Next slide, please. 
Um, this is a very useful site um, where you can actually measure the heaviness or the carbon footprint of your own website. You can enter the um, URL with the address and it will calculate the grams of carbon oxide uh, that is um, produced by um, uh, visiting either their page or the heaviness of your website. So um, this is a call for designers to think, you know, of vivid images, light, uh, not too many full, uh, full on photos. And, um, and the next slide, please. Uh, what I wanted to share with you, and this is a, with a big disclaimer because I'm not um, uncertain about uh, and the numbers, uh, they could be questionable, the algorithm that's been used is the energy guide that's produced in 2000 and in January this year. And um, uh, about the particular um, uh, use of, um, of email and, and how much does it weigh and what's the impact of each. Uh, keystroke on our, of our computer in terms of energy spent. So the disclaimer I have is that the energies, it, that the technology is moving much faster and uh, we will see something later on what's being done to actually um, soften the impact of internet as a technology producing uh, too much of a carbon um, footprint. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the uh, you know as, as i said the the low tech magazine questions the belief in in technological progress but we know we are going forward and it although it highlights the potential of past knowledges and technologies um, we need to design and need think at every step how to design a more sustainable society so um the the, because the, the internet is becoming more efficient, maybe these calculations do not hold. That's why you'll see a star next to some of these um, calculations. It says that one megabyte email is um, during its total life cycle admits about 20 gram of carbon dioxide, which is an equivalent of 60 watts, a lamp lit for 25 minutes. And the 20 emails per day use over one year create the same uh, carbon dioxide emissions as a car traveling 1,000 kilometers. And then and there's also a, a, a data point about data centers, uh, which are currently built next to renewable. Um, some of them are built next to renewable sources of energy in order to there for their supply chain to be uh, more carbon neutral. And uh, you can see there's a link there to a medium um, website where we can see that Google's AI learnings um, uh, are with DeepMind are actually uh, trying to see how to regulate the data center cooling and they found this um, very helpful. Next slide, please. Um, so there are more data here about the web search and how much is a web search um, uh, blowing <laughs> CO2 and energy. And um, it says that, you know, that if a web ma user makes an average of 2.6 web searches per day, this user can uh, be extrapolated to be emitting 9.9 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per year. Obviously, we do more than, than uh, 2.6 searches a day. And uh, a year browsing the net, an average internet user yearly needs about uh, 365 kilowatts electricity and some 2,900 liters of water, which corresponds to CO2 that is emitted when you travel a good 1,400 kilometers by car. Next slide. And um, we need to ask ourselves why is the internet electricity foot, um, and therefore carbon footprint so huge and it's also because of the uh, amount of electricity that is needed for internet to, to run and we know the infrastructures in the ground and then the computers and the waste and resource materials that are needed. Uh, for that um, infrastructure, but yes, uh, web although um, web infrastructures can be oversight, I think uh, that is now also counteracted with some serverless um, ways of communication and dynamic pages. So that's no longer an, an issue. And also it's been said that applications that are installed on our smartphones are draining your battery, but also some 
um, applications that are not used very often. They just basically die in the background and they don't use very much electricity. So these arguments that you can see on the net do not necessarily hold. Some may, uh, some may not. And uh, But one thing to remember, though, is that a wired uh, connection in your house is always much better than a Wi-Fi connection in your house because the latter emits energy and then it heats the air. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, a photo of the data center, um, a Google's um, data center where DeepMind AI reduces the cooling bill by 40% of by environmental defense fund but as i say some of these data centers are trying to be um, uh, smart and they do install their data centers next to a sources of renewable power plants next slide and so uh will the internet uh, um, impact the overall carbon use negatively or positively this is an answer that, that, that we are looking for, and um, certainly it will not reduce the carbon use directly, but uh, no internet application will stop the carbon use from your car. <laughs> it's obviously uh, obvious, but an application that might help you is to avoid using your car like we're doing today. We're having a virtual meeting. and. Um, but uh, it is a fact that internet uses a lot of um, raw energy and many rare materials, and there's many, there's a huge impact on environment uh, by extracting these minerals to make the um, components of the internet as we know today. So um, what the internet cannot do in terms of reduction of energy resources, I think is a good question to ask. Well, it cannot affect physical processes directly, but it can only have an indirect effect. Next slide, please. Um, uh, I wanted to um, point a very important scientist, Elia Goldratt, who said he had this famous saying, I'll tell, if you tell me how you measure me, I'll tell you how I behave. And he has uh, designed many, um, important theories of constraints for design and it's um, just for those um, you know who are um, looking at the ways to 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 further study theory of constraints and how that's helpful in designing our future but also thinking of innovation and innovating products mm, next slides please um so what could internet technologies actually do? This is the last part of the presentation. They can inform and measure, for example, what's the situation and you can include these measurements and staying informed. And you can also form communities, which is very important um, by using the internet technologies to stay abreast, to, uh, to plan, to associate, to uh, learn, to study, to entertain and so on. That's uh, more or less the obvious. Um, next slide, please. Uh, but it can also um, replace, I think. Replace is one of the important um, things uh, that the internet can do. And we're going to see just uh, more and more replacement going forward um, during um, COVID. The fear lo you lo use just not just of travel and work, but yes, as we said, virtual meetings and travel destination. It saves a lot of money not having to be at the other end of the of the planet um, to um, travel and um, for e-commerce to, to carry on. Uh, it's also a big, big save is really downloading um, uh, of books instead of buying physical books uh, because we know how print is detrimental. And it can also optimize. So I've, I've chosen these four kind of functions where I see the internet technologies could help. Uh, when you're in a car, it can uh, really calculate the fastest route so that you can use the less fuel and, and so on. Next slide, please. And uh, one of the technologies um, that has been talked about and it's been very hyped is the Internet of Things technology. So if you imagine having like um, um, satellites and observatory things looking out at the um, universe, <laughs> what the IoT does is kind of looking down into the, into the earth to see 
all the seismic changes with multiple of sensors and it's trying to listen in to weather changes, it's trying to measure air pollution, and it's trying to give us an information, and it's trying to give us some kind of a prediction um, as much as possible um, uh, of where we are and also trying to um, to make sure that the right place at the right time. Now we have to understand there are several types of Internet of Things. There's the industrial Internet of Things where after the BP spill in the Mexican uh, Bay, you would have millions of sensors uh, literally installed around um, these uh, big pipes coming out to the sea to see any other potential sport, um, uh, oil spills. Um, you have these millions of sensors built into the dam of Amsterdam so that the sea rises um, and the levels um, of sea, you know, do not flood the city and so on. And then you have this um, consumer's internet of things, um, which um, usually are um, uh, sometimes uh, poorly designed and um, sometimes also called the internet of broken things because they do not last uh, very long. Uh, they have a, um, a short lifetime span and they end up in probably in Ghana, where is the biggest uh, waste of all the electrical goods. So um, it, it's, it's good to say, um, yeah, and to differentiate between um, the use of, of Internet of Things and, and how negligent some of the manufacturers are uh, in terms of our ecology. Next slide. Um, this is Lee Felsenstein, who came to one of our ecology hackathons here in Belgrade in 2017, I believe. And um, he was making an induction charger here with one of the ETF students, the students of electrical engineering in Belgrade. And, um, and next slide, please. Um, uh, we talked a lot about how we need to re-engineer um, our society and, uh, and he wrote a really nice piece to Greta Thunberg and friends, a very hopeful one as, as to how technologies could help um, uh, to reinvent and make our society more sustainable. Next slide, please. Um, a, a, what I think um, he had said that I really see as an important step is that we still have this open source, uh, uh, both uh, software and hardware technologies where individuals can make things not being dependent on just um, people um, um, with um, with big money, so we are gaining the ability to define and carry out development projects without having to submit ourselves uh, to the dictates of of those who play power games with money and people. I think is um, what he actually said. And um, in in having this um, crowdfunding through the internet, having the disintermediation where you remove the middlemen like resellers and um, and suppliers, the manufacturer and the end buyer are, are connected by 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 the internet, and you can use the social media and other tools to. Um, individuals uh, in, that are working in small groups can create products, um, ideas and designs, and, and they can describe how to show, you know, prospective buyers and users how to collect donations and that could be converted into orders and when the product is, is shipped. So this development work is, is um, usually carried out under the observation of the donors. And, um, and there is, um, you know, regular web journal of information is always expected and, and a centralized organization is not necessarily here the most um, desirable process, but we have choices, I think is the, is the point um, here of how to go forward. Um, next slide. And this is a picture of Belgrade, uh, next slide, when we can see the quality of air, I think, on it. And therefore, I want to just uh, single out one thing that uh, we did as a community here in Serbia. Uh, our response to Lee Felsenstein um, call was um, to, that we designed a um, open source and hardware device. Um, and you can find a GitHub where you can uh, see how it works. And we uh, set up... Uh, 
with the help of um, some donors, we trained 20 or 30 people in Belgrade to make a clean Merco. Um, and we then set up a citizen initiative, Vazduk Grajanima, or Air to the Citizens, um, where they can monitor the pollution of air using the Internet of Things technology um, uh, to make sure that they can um, leave the house because the, the information is available about the quality of air outside. Next slide, please. Um, this is what it looks like, this small device. Um, so it's completely homebrew or and developed by the community and maintained by the community. Next slide, please. Um, um, you, you can uh, see this is the GitHub page where the source code is at and where you can see what parts you need and you can order yourself if you want to get involved. So what this is really about is like this participatory um, engagement of, of citizens to realize the perils of not just the environment and, and but how to engage them in to be the direct publishers and democratize the data of, of the air quality in Serbia. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, we have uh, then in November this year uh, launched a step to step a single video um, teaching you how to weld uh, certain parts, the CPU, the Wi Fi elements, and how to print a box for it and you can also put it in a single box and and uh, the website where you can check the measurements of the current ones uh, next slide uh, you'll see the map i think um and we have some next steps and that we're going to develop even more sensors not just to look at um, carbon dioxide currently it looks at particular matters uh, pm1 and 10 and 2.5 and these are the um, you know, the things to stay in your lungs, they can go into your lungs and the CO2 emissions can stay in the atmosphere for like thousands of years. And yet the particular matter could also um, uh, stay in, in our lungs um, for a lifetime. So it is a really uh, huge matter of concern. Um, and um, therefore that's one of the uh, initiatives that I'm, I think it's um, important. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, this is the Klimerko or Vazdu Grajanima website where you can monitor it. And next slide, please. Um, I want to um, say a um, few things. This happened in April 10th in Belgrade. I went to the um, ecological um, protest and it was a, a very good atmosphere to see thousands of people um, asking uh, politicians to do something because we cannot do these changes without proper policies and without um, governmental help and huge, huge political will. Uh, we definitely need support um, from uh, uh, private sector, but also government. And we have a lot of activists and people who are concerned. Um, but to move the needle, uh, we need um, a huge um, political will, will and therefore <laughs> a reminder to vote green as David Wallace from the Inhabitable Earth reminds us. Next slide, please. Um, as um, you might think that um, some, the topic of a climate change, according to Steve Pinker, um, you know, this disaster may not yet happen because we uh, humans are very genuine in finding out how to um, find solutions, but they do not send um, people to talk to children about the effects of climate change and that it will have on our planet over the next years to children because they're very impressionable, but some adults could be very impressionable um, too. And, um, and, and therefore it's kind of a thin line, but I do think it is really a task of a younger generation to deal with this. And luckily we have a good young generation that, that is, um, you know, um, they are scientists and they are um, also, we need people from all walks of life. And um, to end on, a, on a, I think, on a, on a good note uh, is that I would recommend uh, to read Rutger Bregman because what he talks about, and, and this is another New York bestseller, is that in essence, humans are collaborative. And therefore, 
once you know about the problem and what the issues are, um, humans will um, find a way to collaborate um, to um, soften um, the impact of, of the climate peril that's um, in, in front of us. Next slide, please. Um, so just to see some of the, the things what we need to do and uh, how some of the internet technologies could help is we need to rebuild and reinvent society with this long-term sustainability in mind. We need to reduce the uh, greenhouse um, gas emissions and we need to have, it's only one third of preservation um, projects that is um, uh, you know, part of the solution of the pie. And we need to reinvent the economy instruments for the offset and people need to be comfortable with this financial instrument. And we need to deploy the low emission technologies and we need to foster innovation, mass innovation, but not mass production. And we definitely need a public and private. And when I say public, I mean here political will and government buying into this. And it has to be a, um, a joint effort. There's a good link there to some other um, thinking about international policies and, and the root of all this. Um, next slide, please. Yes, so I think um, let me stop here and then um, open the floor to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jenka. Uh, if you have any questions, it would be great to pose them now at this point. Anyone? Well, I have a question. Okay, uh, please. Uh, so there's Mr. Kul Karni. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've, been a, I've been a part of uh, Descon before, but anyway, we have never really had this conversation. I'd like to ask that there is a certain uh, there there is a certain tech set of technologies like the blockchain, and and even you mentioned that DeepMind actually reduced the uh, carbon footprint of uh, at, at google so the point is i have read many articles on ai and blockchain that specifically say that they these are technologies even though they add a lot of redundancy and there's a lot of value in the conclusions they have a massive carbon footprint right the deep mind algorithm itself it's you know because of the amount of gpu computation it needs it has a huge footprint how do you see these technologies evolving in the future? Is it? Do you think it is feasible to aim for these technologies to be climate change friendly, or is it just that we we have to live with a a, a very inefficient uh, model for blockchain and just just accept that it's going to be a very carbon intensive uh, process? Um, thank you, Nilay, for the question. It's an excellent question. And uh, I haven't specifically mentioned blockchain technologies, uh, but it's no secret that blockchain technologies are very energy intensive. And, um, and it's um, something that they've been trying to solve, uh, I think, with the proof of work, trying to make it less intensive. But there is... Uh, um, there's, I, I think, an absolute, um, I, I think, uh, not just refusal to, to, to use these technologies. What I think is that um, we are not going back, that we something will have to live with. And um, with, dot, uh, with AI and, and DeepMind, I also agree that algorithms are, um, at one hand, trying to make it more efficient. Um, the, if, for example, the, what we saw, this, the, this example of cooling um, data centers, but also at the, at, the, at the same time, they're making a huge um, data processing uh, and demands and uh, they're making a huge um, use of, um, um, yeah, of, of energy. Uh, so it will be um, hard to stop, I would say, because it has already moved on so much forward. And uh, yeah, I'd be interested in, in your in your thinking too. Um, 
it's um, it, it's inevitable. It's it's almost impossible to to stop. But um, certainly, people are or there are people who are refusing to use a blockchain for everything, <laughs> um, as it's been uh, more or less promoted um, as a pill for any problem on the internet in terms of transactions. So I would definitely caution uh, people about the assumption uh, about the use, uh, the heavy use of energy needed for um, both blockchain and AI. Thank you so much. So we have uh, on one side innovation that can help reduce emissions, uh, such as electric cars, I guess. And on the other side, we have some uh, you know, technologies like blockchain that, uh, you know, make the problem bigger. Uh, what do you think about, uh, about nuclear energy as part of solution? Um, thank you um, for that question too. Um, yeah, it's not internet related, but I think I mentioned thorium as well as one of the uh, similar, it's also a nuclear energy solution. Um, so it's uh, just a different way. And I think there is a lot of hope in using thorium as well. We are not, um, nuclear energy could be clean energy. And I think we will need all of them, nuclear energy and renewables um, for what we are actually do not need is fossil fuel, is coal and oil. And um, we can sometimes even see that coal industries are pertained as the dirtiest industry. And I see that very hypocritical from those who are still investing in oil and, 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 um, and fossil fuel and gas energies. Uh, so it's uh, really a question of, um, of uh, finding this balance between using nuclear energy, renewables, um, what's some of the coal and, um, and fossil fuel energy together. And uh, environmentally, yes, um, we think we need to make these containers uh, and put them under the ground the same way that the plants take carbon dioxide from the, ex from the atmosphere and put them down into the ground with their roots. So that's what we're doing as humans. We're taking out the CO2 and or the nuclear waste and putting it down into the ground in special containers. And that requests um, investment and money and careful. So um, I guess uh, you see a future in artificial meat uh, or maybe you know turning vegan what do you think about that uh, because uh, artificial meat is connected to innovation and uh, bill gates promotes this idea uh, do, do you think that um, uh, we would have to turn to artificial meat at some point it all depends, um, you know, I think it all depends on the pace of how seriously we, we find solutions and innovations to deal with climate change. And if we are carbon neutral by 2030, not just on the paper by offsetting um, money, but really being carbon neutral, uh, we may not need to go there. But it seems very likely that um, if, if you think that um, even these machines um, to produce biomass that I mentioned, we would need one third of farmable land uh, to be, produce biomass uh, as a burning oil uh, instead of um, something instead of fossil fuels, for example. Um, so there is less and less farmable land to grow, to feed ourselves, and then there's less uh, farmable land, you know, to grow and uh, also have animal-based um, products. And if you think why in India people are mostly vegetarians, because there isn't enough land for the cows to grass, uh, you know, to, um, to, to, to eat. And um, so I, I see that um, as an option, and I think um, I'm, I'm not promoting it because I, I'm um, particularly vegetarian, but uh, myself. <laughs> um, but I think there will be um, like vertical, there will be much more um, uh, plants that are being based uh, in urban areas as well. And we're not going to go to farmlands. You have this uh, vertical in um, uh, in-house vertical um, greenhouses where you have plants and seeds and um, we'll see the urban um, parts changing into our uh, farmlands as well, the abandoned houses, the abandoned buildings. Okay, um, so now we can see uh, a future 
we can you know get a glimpse of the future uh, alexandra would you like to uh, you know to, to say something please alexandra bulatic from the institute would you like to join because you sent a comment and i thought you would it would be great if you could uh, say a few few words Uh, Alexandra, are you here? Or should I read it? Yes, please. Yes, please. Because it's maybe, difficult maybe you can speak. read it. It's better. <laughs> or you you have uh, kids around and it's very loud loud. All right, uh, Alexandra wrote that UNDP has recently introduced a number of projects to support that could contribute to protection of environments, decrease pollution, raise awareness. My impression is that uh, mostly uh, those projects are not cost effective. Uh, for example, a project targeting school children in 10 schools is about positioning uh, 10 Klimerco sensors during one year uh, for close to uh, 200,000 euros. This is uh, very bad for PR, for the cause, and it seems uh, that rather it is a form of uh, green washing PR. How to confront such waste of resources, including uh, goodwill and enthusiasm of people? Okay, thank you for your question. Yeah, I can answer that uh, question, and I I think the um, your figures are not correct. Um, it's not ten schools, and it's not ten climercos. Uh, we um, I think you're referring to a project that's on UNDP site um, where there's been around fifty devices and many workshops, and also a lot of calibration, including Institute of Venture that's gone into a project that's half of the price that you are mentioning here. <laughs> uh, so I know uh, what project you're relating to and therefore the figures you have are not correct, I'm sorry. Um, there's also a question I think earlier on from- Simona. Yes, uh, a question from Simona Zikic. Um, okay, uh, we would like to hear your thoughts about uh, ethics in marketing today. Uh, if we look at internet as free space for, uh, for citizen initiatives and uh, citizens, uh, especially about protection of uh, day, private data. Okay, this is question from... Um, from, I guess, uh, faculty from, of media and communications. And uh, Simona, who initiated this lecture. Thank you, Simona, for, uh, for you know, bringing such a great speaker to the Dig Lab. Simona is our member. And, um, and uh, uh, please, could you, could you please answer, Desiree? Uh, certainly. Thank you for the question, Simona. And It's um, not related to the topic i guess but um, um, well, it is so about no, the internet and data definitely it's a very important both questions that you bring in one is the ethics in in marketing today i think that uh, requires a whole new session um, but um, i know that there's also been a study at the stanford trying to figure out how much carbon footprint do ads banner ads generate as well um, and the, it was then calculated in 2015 that one megabyte of banner ads is 7.7 .7 gram of uh, carbon dioxide. Um, but then when you move that to 3G and 4G networks, it goes higher. And uh, this is something that is actually missing in, in the, um, from the media and from the internet marketing, uh, that you need to think of the users in Africa. They do not have uh, high download speeds as well. 
So when you think about images and, and this example that I mentioned, uh, the solar powered website, where it actually goes down as many visitors that it accepts the website, actually the color of the website changes saying it's, hey, it's overloaded. You know, the lamps are going down, down, down. And at some point it turns itself off. Um, but I think your uh, second question is a really also important one in terms of the data protection of um, private individuals. And we know that um, general data protected from uh, regulation from the EU has to be implemented elsewhere in the world. It's extraterritorial and here as well. And um, this could be a nice combination where people actually learn that they need to protect their data and they are producers of their data, but um, they, they should anonymize data that they want to contribute about, uh, that they produce about the environment, for example, from, uh, you know, um, and it could anything that leads to reduction of too much um, data is is a good thing uh, because it eventually uh, turns out into the CO2 emissions and it turns and, and contributes to the overall warming of the planet. And when we think about the average one Celsius degree globally, we think it's not too much, but we actually think of the Arctic pole, the it's four degrees, um, the day or the night that the Arctic pole is four degrees warmer. It doesn't mean it's only one degrees warmer. And that's why we have this huge um, melting of the permafrost and the icebergs and so on. Um, so, um, and, you know, every time we look at the planet it's, and the climate change, it's happening to somebody else. It's somebody else's planet instead of our own and what's, what we are actually contributing to. So we need to be aware of, um, uh, of the way how we safeguard our private data, but also we need to be very um, tolerant of accepting of others, but we have to be very conservative about our output. All right, we have greetings from the Faculty of Forestry, University of Belgrade, especially from the Dean, Professor Ratko Ristic, who was one of the speakers at the ecological protest in April of 2021 in Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, regards to our, our lecture today uh, and thank you very much for participating. Um, we had a really great uh, lecture. We now, you know, got some ideas about the future uh, and, uh, you know, um, something to think about. We have a homework and thank you for spreading the word about such important issue and connecting the internet. Um, I'm going to think the next time I send an email, uh, how uh, much impact it would have to our environment. So uh, many interesting ideas and uh, you know facts that we were faced uh, today. Uh, it, uh, the, the lecture will be online on the YouTube channel of the, the, of the Institute and um, uh, we are looking forward to meeting uh, you again and to listening to your thoughts and maybe reading uh, some book about this, uh, these issues. Okay, thank you very, very much, Jelka. Thank you, every, um, everyone. Yes. Thank you, Ljubiša. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all for questions and comments. Great, looking forward to online. For looking forward to the further cooperation between the DigiLab and, and Jelka and her great initiatives. Uh, thank you to the participants as well and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.